Hello, welcome everyone to the Jobs Reset Summit. My name is Rebecca Blumenstein. I'm a deputy managing editor with the New York Times, and we're really thrilled to have this discussion today. Uh, just a quick note on, on, on what we're trying to tackle here. Um, this session is linked to a very exciting publication that just happened today, a briefing called Dashboard for a New Economy toward a new compass for the post-COVID recovery. The deep disruption caused by COVID in nearly every country has forced societies around the world a moment of pause about what is truly of value. Rebuilding a post-pandemic economy will require a more comprehensive definition of success, economic success, in terms of what should serve for a guide for the recovery. Despite a lot of talk of different measures, we're still seeing a lot of discussion about GDP as the core economic policy around the world. There's a lot of discussions about a V recovery, a K recovery, but, but that really falls short because disturbing trends that we're seeing are that COVID has exacerbated um, losses of jobs, there's uh, predictions of increases in automation, that the digital disruption um, caused by the, um, the internet revolution is only going to accelerate and that we really may never get back in many countries to the job levels we saw before COVID. Business has started the, down this path in terms of, of um, different success metrics, looking at stakeholders rather than just shareholders. And now there's a call uh, for the role of government and further defining what that should be. So to help us in that endeavor, I'm very pleased to, uh, to introduce our esteemed panel. Um, Sharon Barrow is General Secretary of the International Trade Union Fe Confederation, which is the largest trade union in the world. And Bob Moritz is Global Chairman of PwC USA. We will have opening remarks by no other than uh, Professor Klaus Schwab, who we all know, uh, form founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. Um, and before... Thank you very just much. Just a word about today's session format. Um, uh, just uh, Professor Schwab, just to let people know that for the first 30 minutes, this will be live streamed. Um, the last 15 minutes, um, we'll have a... A, a chat available to top link participants only. And um, anyone during the, uh, the interim can please, please uh, submit questions of your own on, on the chat function and I will do my best to convey them to our participants. And now over to you, Professor Schwab, for some opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. Um, this um, uh, summit is called the Job Reset Summit and actually it's integrated into a major in undertaking of the World Economic Forum. Um, to design a global reset, we have on the one hand the need to fight the pandemic, to recover, to come back to the economic output which we had at the beginning of the summit, but also to design the policies and um, practices for the after Corona, pan, after, the, after the pandemic uh, era. So there are three objectives for this great reset. It is to make the world more resilient, more cohesive, and more sustainable. And this provides us with three key objectives. To make the world uh, more resilient means to prepare our societies better for the next pandemic, to create societal robustness, to make the world more sustainable at this moment, it's mainly related to our approach uh, to create a net zero world at, at the latest by 2050. And if we talk about a world which is more cohesive, I think we talk about jobs. Uh, we cannot have a fair world, a cohesive and inclusive world, if we do not create uh, in a sustainable way, um, reasonable, uh, purposeful jobs. So um, it leads us uh, to the notion of how do we create a measurement for society which uh, reflects what we have done and with also with the leadership of uh, uh, Bob Moritz, what we have done in the business world, which means uh, 
to to direct um, our efforts not towards one single objective but to a multiple multitude of integrated objectives so until now we said economic development leads automatically to social progress but i wonder whether this is true i think we have to set um, integrated objectives for society and for economic progress so in this document um, which you refer to rebecca uh, dashboard for a new economy towards a new compass uh, for the post covid recovery we provide a first framework to think in new terms to go beyond gdp and to create a measurement systems which allows uh, the countries to be um, qualified not only on the basis of their economic output but what they really do for people and for livelihoods so today this session in some way or in an important way should be a call for action it should be st the start of a mobilization effort into which we want to integrate the best economists as we have done so but also particularly government and other leaders of in uh, as uh, stakeholder leaders of society back to you rebecca thank you very much professor schwab uh, bob i'd love to start with you uh, business has laid the 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 groundwork uh, for for much of this uh, much of this work how serious is has is the business community about about really moving to a stakeholder model there are there are some who have who have you know really quite frankly called it window dressing are you seeing um, you know are you seeing a a, a shift a, a significant shift in the business world here Thanks, Rebecca, and a pleasure to be here. And let me pick up where um, Professor Schwab left off, which is this is all about a reset. It's a great opportunity for us to rethink what we want that new normal to be. And clearly, when you look at the challenges that each of us are facing with, and these challenges existed before COVID came into existence, they've only been exacerbated and sped up by the issue associated with the pandemic. It's clear that the business community is recognizing a couple of things. First, they have an important role to play in society at large. Second, that they have to think about a broader group of stakeholders on a worldwide basis and the issues that are important to them. And third, they've got to do their part. And by doing their part, we have focused on a couple of things. It is clear that the efforts of the World Economic Forum through their International Business Council has focused on how do we actually move beyond what I'll call the traditional measures moving to some non-financial measures that show a balance of how they are contributing to a more sustainable, appropriately focused stakeholder capitalism. And what we've done here is focus on four things, the planet, people, good governance, and the contributions to society at large. And the business community was behind this effort. We have many standard setters and regulators that were interested in progressing this agenda from a regulatory perspective, but it was the business community that said, we've got to take a first step. Now, why are we doing this? We're actually trying to get better information, more comprehensive information into the right people's hands. Historically, that's only been in the hands of investors as we focus on the stake, the shareholder. But the reality is we see employee activism, consumer activism, financial activism, all over the place now. So the businesses recognize that. The second reason for doing this is to demonstrate progress and comparability so they can differentiate themselves from one another. And I think these same kind of principles when you actually get to more prominence in these other measures, separate and distinct from the historical measures, you see a much more comprehensive approach that the stakeholders can pay attention to and we can get capital in the right place to solve these challenges. Pivoting to the government side of the equation, Rebecca, all of these same principles apply very much to moving away from a primary dependency on GDP as the key economic measure to a much more inclusive series of measures that I think will actually will serve the citizens, governments, and the world at large much better than we have in the past. Um, Sharon, it's uh, great to have you with us. Could you please uh, talk about jobs and how, how acute you think the jobs crisis both is and 
and and and could become uh you know with with um automation and digitization even uh, being accelerated in a, in a kind of secular shift here so jobs is critical it's got to be at the heart of a new social contract we've seen an economic model that's failed working people by any lens inequality people were in despair angry because they couldn't make ends meet on the streets even before COVID-19. Then, of course, the climate emergency was unsettling because governments hadn't been fast enough to secure the plans and the just transition that would give people hope. COVID-19, we've seen 500 million jobs lost in the formal economy, 1.6 billion of the 60% now in a, in a global labour market just collapsing, 60%, including our new internet mediated or platform businesses are informal workers. No rule of law, no minimum wage, no social protection, no hope. And so when you think about that, there has to be a jobs plan in every country, but it must be married with universal social protection. And of course, a transformative agenda to, for women because inequality is not just uh, income, it is, but it's also gender and indeed race. So inclusion is central. And then we need a just transition for the issues that you raise, which will change the face of supply chains forever. And that is technology and climate. And of course, we will have supply chains, but technology is changing the nature of them, global demand and the slumping global demand, people's consumption patterns move to a circular economy, all things we have to do. So we desperately need a jobs plan. But let me tell you how difficult that is, because go from there to the question you asked around business. And yes, there are two business communities. One is absolutely understanding of this and we all work with them. And one is at best mouthing the words or resisting them. And it's a business as usual uh, piece. And that's just not an answer for business or indeed for workers. But I want to give you a framework about why Klaus's report is so important about the reset and going beyond GDP, because less, less than 50% of people now live in democracies, and we must depend on governments, as well as employers and workers and civil society, to actually shape the future. And only 48% of those under 35 believe in democracy, compared to two thirds in the 1990s and the 2000s. That's the first time in living memory that the majority of young people who will be the leaders of the future and are absolutely engaged now in the fight for a socially just and economic future are dissatisfied. And then even within democracies, you have increasing authoritarianism. So if we don't rebuild trust in democracy, which means governments have to become far more accountable to their people, and you're seeing that in a number of countries, smaller countries, but New Zealand, Iceland, Scotland, Wales, Finland, Bhutan, all the well-being economies as they describe themselves. But the ITUC, the workers uh, just put out indeed a report that talked about what measuring what really matters. So Klaus's perspective on this is critical. We want to see governments accountable for living standards, for the economy, for tax, social protection and public services, for democratic rights and freedoms, for the environment and for the engagement of people in their democracies beyond the ballot box. So jobs, that new social contract, social protection, all of the things I framed in passing, they fit within the indicators of both living standards and the economy and how you fund the recovery, how you fund the basic and essential services that we require for our communities. Mm -hmm. And Professor Schwab, you should feel free to jump in here. I want to I want to shift to what specifically um, governments can do um, to actually encourage the, the spread of such measures. Uh, Bob, I'm sure that that as someone who consults businesses, you you don't want governments um, saying, well, you can't lay off workers. But but what what is you know, when you look at success here and encouraging different kinds of, of metrics and behavior, what what specifically would you be advising that governments do? But so if you go back, <clears throat> if you can, let, let's go back to uh, what was said earlier by Sharon. Uh, New Zealand is a great example. 
we're not saying that you need to walk away from the measure of GDP, but rather GDP is an indicator, not the sole measure that is demonstrating the inclusive nature and the benefits that go to society at large, including those that are looking for job, job opportunity and, and success in a shared economic prosperity. Um, so what New Zealand has done is said, look, we're actually gonna bring more prominence to about 60 other measures. Now, whether that's the right number or, or too large of a number, we're not sure, but the reality is they are bringing much more prominence to a host of other measures that are either interdependent with GDP, interconnected to and result in higher GDP over a longer period of time. And that's where the accountability of our government leaders becomes so important in terms of bringing a balanced scorecard to the success that they are looking to achieve for the benefit of their citizens. And for that matter, the betterment of enhanced investment coming into their country from perhaps the outside. So it's just like a business. Just like a business, as we've said on the business side of the equation, your historical looking back measures of net income or a strong balance sheet are important. They're not to be walked away from, but we definitely believe there's a series in the case of the business report that we did, another 20 measures that we would hope the world would see. And again, back to Sharon's point, the accountability be held. And this is the point now I would finalize with uh, Rebecca, which is, by getting the right information out there with the right prominence, the right awareness, you get better accountability. You get better accountability, you make the progress that society and the stakeholders at large want to see. Rebecca, if I may uh, just take up this point, I, I think the time is right because people have become much more um, aware that it is not only material uh, success but there are other things which count in life and COVID has shown us very clearly what, what, what the issues are. Now, um, what we also can learn from the business community and from the, from the uh, initiative uh, which the International Business Council has undertaken, we have to avoid that countries, uh, each country develops its own system. Because what we need is, of course, measurability to get, as Bob said, accountability. We need com comprehensiveness. Uh, we need not just one element like uh, environmental responsibility or decarbonization. No, it's a whole package. And we need uh, universality because otherwise countries cannot be compared each with another. So that's the reason also why uh, the system uh, which we have, uh, the dashboard which we have developed is very much in line with the four uh, criteria uh, which are applied to business. And the ideal situation would be that you have one concept of course with variations where you can really measure the social, environmental and good governance process of uh, countries and of businesses. So, so there is a kind of mirror um, effect. And Rebecca, just to pick up on Professor Klaus's point here, <clears throat> as we look at society at large, we assume GDP was a great measure mm -hmm. to demonstrate the progress society had. And that was done country by country. We have asymmetry right now that proves that's not the case and it's not a relevant measure for the inclusive progress society is making. And therefore these other indicators are tremendously important to move things forward. The power ends up being when you get more comprehensive information on a comprehensive basis out there more consistently, people can make judgment calls, actions can be taken and investment of capital can go in the right places to make the input that we're, the impact that we're looking for. That's a really interesting point because you know the, the dissatisfaction with GDP, uh, growing concern about inequality was a big issue uh, before COVID. And now it feels like it's become now an urgent issue. Um, Sharon, could you um, talk about what, what, what measures would you, you're, you're in Belgium, you're in Europe, there's more of a safety net there than there is in many, many parts of the world, including the US. Are you, um, do you see progress toward this in Europe? Um, or what, what measures do you think are most important for governments to adopt? 
So if you're talking about the recovery itself and planning for a recovery, yes, Europe is setting new benchmarks for the world. There's no question about that. They're looking at corporate behaviour with mandated due diligence. They're financing the recovery with a medium to long-term approach to both investment and managing debt. That's essential for everybody. They frame their recovery on the social pillar and they're actually, just last week, the president of the European Council asked the unions and the employers to sit down and negotiate, indeed, uh, indicators that would take them beyond GDP. So it will be part of the dialogue next, next year. They're also looking at some of the other areas. How do you have a minimum wage on which people can live with dignity right across uh, Europe? How do you actually encourage uh, collective bargaining? What is it that we can do to mandate due diligence, as I said, to end corporate impunity against the global rule of law? So all of these things fit in. But in at its heart is, again, what do we do? How do we actually drive the same capacity, debate, inclusion, dialogue across the rest of the world? And if I could just answer briefly the previous question, if you just take two of our indicators or maybe three, if you look at living standards and think about what the cost of living is, what is the, the share of income necessary through wage growth, minimum wages, average wages, collective bargaining, national poverty benchmarks, all of those things exist in our countries in different ways. If you then marry that with the economy and look at GDP per capita, not GDP overall alone, but GDP per capita, of course, balance of trade, but inequality as well, and net jobs growth, and it's and it benchmarks against full employment, and gender employ the gender employment gap. And if if governments mandated for their central banks to have employment and climate at the heart of uh, of their mandate, then you would get a long way towards that. But what you also need is uh, tax social protection and public services. And they are married because we want a, a tax, not austerity. We need to fund the recovery, but we've seen the scandals in aged care and childcare. We also know in health generally. We also know in health, education, aged care, childcare, there are many more jobs than there are actually in construction. And we need infrastructure vitally for, uh, for jobs, but also for an economic enabling uh, green recovery and so on. And we need, of course, to reinvest in these other vital areas. So looking again at government revenue is critical and then governments being accountable about how they spend that. So we have a lot of work to do, but I tend to agree that, you know, there's not, it, it doesn't matter how many indicators, but we can get this down to an agreed set of framing indicators that actually then governments can choose what is essential with their people as they should to their own context. We have some really good questions coming in from around the world. Uh, one from Brazil um, asks, what changes are needed in the tax system to encourage these, you know, a, a tackling of these new global challenges? You just mentioned taxes, Sharon. Um, so, so again, look at the debates going on in the OECD, the G20 and indeed in Europe. Financing the recovery in Europe, one of the contestable debates is, do you introduce new taxes Europe-wide? And the answer has to be yes. Otherwise, you have to go back to austerity and people will simply lose even more trust in democracy. So in that context, then there's a minimum tax uh, threshold for corporations being debated. There's a new digital tax I don't think anyone disagrees. You have to rein in the global monopoly of the big tech companies. And apart from all the issues, we have to look to manage like privacy and, uh, and digital identity. There's also questions around, uh, you know, the share of wealth and the size of these corporations for fair competition. But then we need uh, to relook again at the, the financial transactions tax. And we really seriously need to look at wealth. You know, you already had it uh, described uh, today, oh, sorry, it was a previous panel, where, you know, the companies that have made money through the pandemic 
could actually share that money with their workers and still be as rich as they were before the pandemic? And at what point do we say we don't need a small group of people to make this much money and that it must be shared? And finally, of course, there is the unfinished business of base erosion and profit shifting, tax havens, uh, beneficial ownership of com company transparency, the issues already on the deck. So it's a big agenda, but it's a vital one if we're going to share our prosperity. Hey, Rebecca, if I can pick up where Sharon uh, went. <clears throat> As we go through COVID-19, there's a need to repair the damage of the past. Um, honestly, we're still in with 10 years of coming out of the financial crisis that we had 10 years ago and some of the lessons learned coming out of that. Now we have to actually repair the damage of increased amount of debt and stimulus implications in terms of the obligation that governments have put on taxpayers. So that's a reality. You couple that with a tax code generally around the world that was created for old world society, not necessarily new world society. So there's a need for systemic change in the tax systems around the world. And what you're looking to do is to create the right incentives for the right sustainable behaviors of government officials, business leaders, community leaders, and the like, to then get to this much more comprehensive approach of how do you solve for a sustainable, much more inclusive economy and a sustainable, much more inclusive world as we think about the stakeholder capitalism that Professor Schwab has talked about in the past. Rebecca, living in Geneva, I, I just want to give you an example. What we have to combine, because uh, we need entrepreneurial activity, we need to foster innovation if we um, want to build also and rebuild the economy. And uh, here in Geneva, even if some people, including myself, suffer, we are not living in a tax paradise, paradise but we have a high income tax, we have no capital gain tax in order to stimulate entrepreneurial activity, but we have a tax on the fortune. And uh, so we combine a distributive element with an incentive uh, to invest uh, into uh, entrepreneurial activities. Uh, at this moment, I need to uh... Uh, conclude, uh, announce the conclusion of the live streaming portion of this segment, but very, and thank our panelists, but very much encourage everyone to stay on registered for TopLink because we're going to keep going with uh, some of these great questions that are coming in from around the world.